shepherding going on. Marina, take it away. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic because it is really hot and there's ton out there about this because people are really, really curious. And just uh, a year or so, there was almost nothing about this. And now we are seeing a lot of talk and a lot of questions and a lot of programs and documentaries and, and uh, podcasts about the ancient stone money. So this is what I will be talking about today. So there are basically two things that are happening here. So the first one is the question about what is stone money and where does it come from? What do we know about this? And the second question is how does the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies relate to this? So what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the stone money is and just very quickly define the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And then I'm going to go into deeper analysis of what the stone money is. And then we will end with a comparison between stone money and the Bitcoin and, the, and other, other cryptocurrencies. So what is really stone money? So stone money, unless you um, maybe heard of it, is a special type of money that was made out of stone on the island of Yap. And we know that that happened like it goes way back centuries ago. And the island of Yap is located in Micronesia. And I will show you, I have a map, I will show you all of this, where Yapis islanders sail to the neighboring island for about uh, 250 miles away each way. And then they would go to this neighboring island, they would carve these special stones, these disks, as you can see in the slide, and then they would transport them back, and then they would use them as exchange and, and, and valuable items in their trade. So we'll come back to this question again in much more detail because it is really important to understand this and, and it is really fascinating. So the second question is, what is cryptocurrency? I'm, this word is a really buzzword, buzzword. It's been a buzzword for at least 10 years. It started sort of, um, yeah, in the um, 2008 is when we start hearing a lot more about it during the, um, the big crash. But generally, the cryptocurrency, which you can see here in the slide, has different, different ways of addressing. So cryptocurrency or crypto dash currency or crypto, just in general, is a digital currency designed to work as a medium of exchange through a computer network that is not reliant on any central authority, such as a government or a bank, to uphold or maintain it. So nowadays, when we talk about these digital currencies, we generally refer to them as cryptocurrencies because there are a lot of them, like 70,000 or some like, or 7,000. There's a lot of these different types of currency. There are some that are very serious, like Ethereum, obviously Bitcoin, this is where it all started. But then there are really crazy ones like banana currency or banana crypto and like Jesus currencies between, um, between some churches and, and so on. But it all really started with the Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the very beginning of this type of digital currency. So the Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency without a central bank or single administrator that can be sent from user to user on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network without the need for intermediaries. So all of these definitions are really confusing. We are still struggling to truly understand, or at least majority of us are still struggling, struggling to truly understand what this, what this actually means and what can we do with this and how this actually works. I was actually really fortunate uh, a couple or two, three years ago, there was a cryptocurrency exchange company here in Calgary that was giving tutorials 
on how to create your own wallet and how to exchange money and how to work with cryptocurrencies. The one that I encountered is located or was at least located in Kensington. So you can check it out because they do often have different types of workshops that you can just join and come and learn more about it. But I'm gonna start from the very beginning because beginnings are always very fascinating. And more than anything, they're very telling about everything that happens afterwards. And anytime we want to understand any concept or any subject matter, the best way to do this is to go all the way back to the very beginning, to the very birth of that event. And that's exactly what we're going to do here with the Bitcoin. It all started kind of very mysteriously in 2008 when we have this um, anonymous person with this pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who this is. We don't know who this person, you know, where does this person come from? Where do they live? Where do they work? What is their background? We know nothing about this person. And at the beginning, it was really thought that this information is going to come out and we will learn um, who was behind the creation of the Bitcoin. But all of these years later, we still have no idea. And we may never really, really know. The reason for that is because it was extremely dangerous when the Bitcoin uh, was created and it came out, when it was introduced and the concept was, um, was made public. So Satoshi Nakamoto um, posted a, what we call a white paper. It's basically a study or an idea titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system to a crypto, crypto, sorry, cryptographic mailing list. Because again, by that, like we don't have cryptocurrency. We don't have any of this at that time. So, and I've included this historic email. This is how we have documents now. We have archives for everything that comes before the digital age. And now we actually archive material that is digital. So this email that you see here on the screen is the original email that was posted by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. And here we have the link to that paper that was introduced. So the concept of Bitcoin that Satoshi introduced here um, is basically using something which is called blockchain. And I will talk a lot more about the blockchain, so don't worry. So blockchain, to solve the double cent problem, uh, spend problem where someone is able to spend a unit of digital currency more than once. So the best way to think about this is the way we write and receive checks. So somebody writes your check and then you deposit this into your bank. And then it takes, um, a few days for that check to be processed. It used to be actually quite a long time, but people got a little bit impatient and many banks now on the smaller amounts automatically grant the amount to the receiver's account with the belief that that money is gonna be cleared. In case the money is not cleared and the check does not go through, the money is then withdrawn by the bank. But that was really the problem. So you can overspend, double spend, because when you deposit the check, the two banks do not communicate. There is no instant connection between these authorities, these institutions, and there needs to be a delay in communication until this transaction is truly cleared. So that was really the solution of the blockchain to stop this from happening. So then in January 2009, Nakamoto released software that launched the network and the first units of Bitcoin cryptocurrency, um, which concern and confuse very much the various government agencies and financial institutions like banks. So everybody got really, really upset. And there are fantastic documentaries that, can, that you can watch online. I remember there are a few on Netflix that I also have seen. They're really interesting in documenting the beginning of cryptocurrency and how it was seen as criminal because it was perceived as a huge threat to the governments and financial institutions. Out of that fear, we started to get a lot of um, news releases how 
the digital currency or the bitcoins at the time were being used. We hear a lot of, we heard a lot about the dark net, about the criminals, about terrible things that were being done with this money. But as anything that is ever invented in human history, there's always a good side to it and a bad side to it. That's just how absolutely everything works. So, uh, and it was exactly the same here, except these large institutions, very powerful institutions, were, were threatened to the core by this new invention. And it took a, a while for this sort of to settle down. And now we are seeing the acceptance of this new invention, because honestly, there is no, no way going back. And many, many uh, banks and governments are creating their own cryptocurrencies, including the Bank of Canada. We have a couple um, scholars here at the University of Calgary who are consulting with the Bank of, Bank of Canada and working with them to create the most optimal version of the Bank of Canada cryptocurrency. So, but there was also excitement, as I said, at the prospect of changing the way we perceive currency and its movement through the global economy. And we see Bitcoin emerging as the most widely recognized and highly valued cryptocurrency in the world. So leading to development of then many other cryptocurrencies, as I mentioned, that we now have hundreds and hundreds of different cryptocurrencies. So now connecting that stone money and the cryptocurrencies. This is really interesting because we know that YAP stones and YAP stone money, they have been studied for a really, really long time by anthropologists. It has only been quite recently that this comparison and the YAP money piqued the interest of economists and others in the modern financial sector because of the incredible similarities that we see between the blockchain technologies uh, of cryptocurrencies and the way how that stone, stone money operated on this tiny, tiny little island. So let's talk a little bit more about that stone money of YAP and what does that actually mean? What else do we know about the money? So here I have the, the map. You can see uh, right, so we have Australia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, China, Japan. And then right here, this is called Micronesia, this area. We have the island of Yap, which is right here. And we have the islands of Palau right uh, next to it. So it's not as close, but uh, this is where they are on the map. The stones themselves uh, are called Rai by the Yapese population, by the islanders. And we know that they existed in the culture for a very long time. How long? is not really known because it's so far we do not have archaeological evidence and anthropological evidence to confirm the actual date. Some scholars estimated it goes way back to about 500 common era, uh, but we, we do have evidence in oral histories from the island. However, we do not have any written or any other evidence or archaeological or material evidence to confirm that. The very first material evidence or written evidence that we have that confirms the existence of the stones and the trade with the stones comes in the 18th century from the, from the travelers, that uh, European travelers that um, encountered the island on their way. The stones themselves, as you've seen in the first slide, and I will show you a lot more, look like wheels and they're made out of limestone. And another way to describe them is like millstones. That's a, a good way to remember them. I've already mentioned they were mined on the neighboring island of Palau, which was about 250 miles each way uh, from Yap. The stones themselves can be various sizes and various weights, going all the way like up to five tons. And the diameter can range from a few centimeters to four meters. So to show you what I'm actually talking about is in this slide right here. These are the various stones that are on the island. Um, the island itself is not really a tourist spot. The, you're obviously welcome to stop 
at the islands. You can come and visit, but there, there's only one hotel. And um, the, the native area of the island is off the limits to the tourists, um, and which is a really great way to protect the culture itself. So most of the people that come to visit the island come with a purpose or they're on different cruises um, or on their way passing the island and they usually stop by and check it out. Because as I said, it's becoming really popular to do that. The other types of visitors to the island are people who love diving and snorkeling because they have a, a wonderful uh, places to go diving where you can see shipwrecks and, and um, oh, I forgot, the stingrays are really uh, common in the, in the area. So these are the two main activities that actually put this map on the, uh, on this island on the map. Otherwise it's really off, off the beaten path, which is what, what allowed it to protect its culture for a very long time. But you can see that stone money that I've been talking about is quite fascinating. The sizes of these stones is, is absolutely remarkable. And there are a lot of questions that arise about these stones. How did they make them? How did they transport them? How did they carry them? Like, how did they move them? How did they move them around? What were they worth? How did they exchange them? What could you buy for it? And, and so on. Lots of questions. So here we have um, a photograph from the 19th century, so late 19th century, and a lot of our photographic material comes from late 19th century, but it's absolutely invaluable for us to, to study um, this culture and their currency. So what do we know so far about the origin of these stones and the, their production? So we do know, and a lot of things that we do know actually is thanks to an amazing scholar from the University of Oregon called Scott Fitzpatrick, who had spent over 20 years um, collaborating with the island government and um, being, being given access to study the stones and uh, an ability to talk to the islanders. So a lot of the information that we do have comes from him and many of his colleagues that also study um, the, the, the culture of the islands. So we do know that the, the stones were uh, mined or carved on Palau, and then they would transport them across the ocean on these rafts, and they would attach the outrigged um, rafts to their canoes, as you can see right here in this photograph, which is absolutely scary. It's scary even when the sea is calm as it is in this photograph, but the seas are not usually calm. A lot of storms, um, a lot of um, terrible waves and winds. So, and we do know from their records as well that there were a lot of accidents and deaths uh, during the transportations of the stones. The stone money was, because of these conditions, quite rare, and it had to be restricted in size. There are two types of stones that we can track. So one uh, type of stones is the stone that was carved with primitive tools, or I should say uh, before Europeans or brought their electric tools and, and different machines. The, the stones were carved primarily with other stones and shells. Uh, later on, when the Europeans arrived, especially like in that 19th century, they brought their machineries and big ships and they negotiated with the islanders to help them uh, transport the stones and carve the stones for the payment, payment of coconut meat, which was a very desirable commodity in Asia at the time. So the earlier stones, before the help of European travelers, um, were up to four meters in diameter, which is still huge. And later ones can really exceed, as I mentioned, five tons and plus. Here is an artist illustration of how we believe the transportation of the stones happened. Uh, 
so they would cross open water with these rafts and canoes and it's it's absolutely remarkable that they were able to do that the excavations were done on the island of palau trying to understand the production of the stones more and here you can see a couple of photographs for fitzpatrick's uh publications. This is one from 2001. And his most recent publication, which I highly recommend, and it's available online, is the one from 2000, uh, 2021, Banking on Stone Money, Ancient Anecdotes to Bitcoin, uh, and the, uh, Antecedents to Bitcoin. But what we do see here is an unfinished um, stone that was not carved to the very end, the one to the left. And we see that, at least based on the evidence that we have so far, is that if the stone cracked or was damaged in any way, they would just abandon it and they would leave it in its original location. They would not try to make it smaller or adjust it in any way. They would just abandon it. It is believed, at least based on the oral history, that the stones were originally carved in the shape of a full moon. And then when they tried to transport them to their canoes, they realized that this was a really impossible task. And then the holes were carved in the middle of them to be able to um, put a wooden pole through it and then roll it around or carry it that way. And we can see that in this illustration here. For special festivals, um, the, the islanders stage this incredible festivities and processions where we can see them carrying the stones and National Geographic has documented one of these festivals. Many of these photographs, especially the modern ones come from, from that uh, work from uh, National Geographic. But here you can see how the, how the, the whole has the the wooden um, pole through it and that's how they were carrying the stone yeah sometimes for the smaller ones they could use the ropes but uh, this is in general how it was done this is another archival photograph where we can see they're carrying this giant stone and as it is calculated, some of these stones that they were carrying this way could weigh pretty much as a small car. This was not a small feat at all. Here is uh, one of the photographs by the National Geographic photographers where we can see they're carrying the stones. So we have the stones that are on the island itself. And then we have the stones that have uh, sunken to the bottom of the ocean due to the storms. So another great activity on the island, especially for the divers, is to go and visit those stones, like in being able to see them underwater. And this is a quote from Fitzpatrick's uh, interview, where he tells the story of how he learned about these stones at the bottom of the ocean. And he basically says, one time, according to the island's oral tradition, a war crew was bringing a giant stone coin back to Yap on a boat. And just before they got back from the island, to the island, they hit a big storm. The stone wound up at the bottom of the ocean. The crew made it back to the island and told everybody what happened. And everybody decided that the piece of stone money was still good, even though it was on the bottom of the ocean. So somebody today owns this piece of stone money, even though nobody's seen it for over 100 or more years. This is not an isolated incident. There are a, definitely a few stones that are still in transactions that are still being used and belong to somebody and they're passed on from generation to generation. So here are uh, a few more photos of the divers encountering the stones that are at the bottom of the, of the ocean. The expedition that were um, organized and permitted by the chief. So essentially the, the authority lay with the village chief. And you can see this again, wonderful photograph from 2004 of a chief sitting uh, 
in front of one of the giant stones behind him. So we can see uh, from this photo and other photos in some of the oral history as well, that the stones were also used as thrones and as symbols of power. The values of these stones, it's equally interesting. If we use our modern logic, we would think that the, the largest stones are the most valuable stones. Um, maybe the cracked stones or any uh, damages to the surface of the stone would take the value away from the stone. But that is not at all how the, the value of the stones actually works. The value is based on shape, size, quality, effort, transportation, and individuals who are associated with the carving and the transportation of the stone. So what we do know is that each stone had a pedigree, as we would call it. But the most important element of these stones was the journey. So the journey that each stone undertook from Palau back to Yap. So the harder the journey and the more people were at risk or possibly even died because of this stone, the value of the stone went up. And especially some, in some special cases, the stones were also given uh, names according to the quarries, according to the canoes uh, that were used for transporting and so on. So we can see right, uh, right from the beginning that these stones is, uh, they're definitely not something we would expect the money would work. And it's it's very different way of thinking about value and thinking about currency. So yeah, naming the stone may have secured its value since such identification would convey, again, all of the cost that was associated with it. And some of the um, archeological uh, and ethnographic uh, evidence that we have, this is also from the late 19th century, we are told that at least 10% of the island's adult male population was involved in carving and transporting these stones. So basically 10% of island's male population was involved in this money cutting business, which is quite a lot. It was a huge part of the local economy. When the stones then arrived to the island, the chief would inspect the stones and because of the lack of writing, everything that was remembered or marked or noted about a stone was then put into the memory of the chief. And the, we have the oral, oral transmission of that information from generation to the generation of the, uh, of the families of the chiefs. So they essentially functioned as central bankers. So this is where the information really lay. That was sort of the, the, the primary center of that information, but not the only one. The chiefs controlled the, the quantity of the stones that were in circulation or stones that were able to be carved. There's also talk about chiefs taking um, sort of like we would call it interest when the stones arrived to the island. And, but even though we see that chiefs had a lot of influence, they did not have any influence over rise worth or their value. That was actually determined collectively by the villagers, by the islanders, based on that loosely agreed um, and accepted set of factors that were already mentioned. So here is another wonderful photograph um, where we see a chief on the right uh, with uh, a little girl on the left standing by the stone. And the, the job as well of each chief and his family was to remember that oral history of each stone. Here as well in this photo, you can see how the stones were placed on the island. And this is another really fascinating uh, story about these placement of the stones. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So once the, these stones or the rise were brought to the island, and then the ownership was established by the chief and the rest of the villagers, then the stone would actually be placed in a specific location. 
So either the stones were placed in front of houses, like uh, in some of the images that I have. This is a community hall. So it was placed on in, in front of community halls. It was placed on the main streets in the village and on the island uh, um, dancing grounds as well. And they were meant to be there pretty much forever. The stones rarely, if ever moved, especially the large ones never ever moved and were not intended to move. The, the stones were heavy, also fragile because the limestone is quite a fragile stone. And um, we see that even when the ownership changes of the stones, the stones locations does not change. And this is really where it gets very, very interesting. And this is that primer, that core of the concept of the Yap stone that connects it to the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So what happened is that the community would keep all of that necessary information in oral history or what we call the oral ledger that was meant to ensure that the new owner was reported and the ownership could, could not be disputed uh, by others. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but here's another a wonderful photograph where we see the stones placed uh, around the house. So the stones, because they were only in its place and in their place and then never moved, the, the only way that these transactions with the stones happened was basically publicly, very, in a very transparent way, in front of the whole community through that oral history or the oral ledger. So what that means is that the community would get together and the stones would then be publicly either assigned or given, the new stones would be assigned or given to the new owners and then everybody would publicly know that. So full transparency about the ownership of the stones, or if there was any major transactions between the different uh, villagers, again, everybody would get together and there would be a, a special event where it would be recognized the change of the ownership, uh, sorry, the change of the ownership would have been recognized and it would have been public knowledge and entered into that oral history and everybody's memory. The stones, even the smaller ones, were placed um, in open spaces publicly without any security, even because, as I mentioned, not just the large stones necessarily carry the larger value, but even the smaller ones and possibly even the smaller ones could be carried away. But we know that there is zero theft on the island, at least when it comes to the stones because the stone without that oral history, without that oral ledger is worthless. So stealing the stone is completely pointless because that transaction is not entered into the memory, uh, collective memory of the villagers and definitely not in the oral ledger. So the stone still, even if it's gone or removed, still technically belongs to, the, to its original owner. If you're wondering what other artifacts or objects were used for transactions on the island, obviously the stones were not used for smaller transactions. For that, we have information like pearl shells, especially black pearl shells were really valuable and common for smaller transactions woven mats, um, coconut meat, which is called taro, or cups of syrup, or, or different uh, items we use for like barter, exchange, or commodities, and, and so on. But the stones themselves were primarily used either um, for big transactions between uh, villages, also for larger transactions between the villagers themselves, like gifts during marriage, also payment for crimes or punishment or buying of the property, a house or, or anything else like that. So yeah, a stone of three spans, basically about 25 inches across, uh, would have been sufficient in the early century to purchase 50 baskets of food or a full-size pig 
while a stone of the size of a man would have been worth many villages or plantations. The stones that were aligned on the streets like this one are actually banks. So they're called Marai, uh, Mar sorry, Mar <laughs> sorry, Mar Al, uh, or stone money banks. And you, if you ever visit the island, you can actually see them on the island um, aligning, lined like this. The stones that are exposed, you can see they're, they're dark color, uh, so they are exposed to weather. Um, many of the stones were also colored by the Germans, I'll tell you that uh, later, um, for different purposes. So, but yes, and the one that you see here on in this photograph is actually the largest or one of the larger stone money banks in Yap. So again, the responsibility of the chief of each village was to know who owned or owns each rye in the bank. And the owners, again, very often did not even live in that village because again, the, the transactions of the stones uh, was conducted very differently. And if you're thinking, is this still the case and what is happening? When did it stop or did it ever stop? Here is a photograph from 1976 where we see a congressman um, uh, and chief uh, chair of uh, YAP council carrying a stone money in the ceremony of the opening of YAP's first bank on the island. So they actually deposited the stones inside the bank. We also know uh, from the records that when the bank in Hawaii as well was open, uh, that the stones were deposited there as well. Uh, very briefly about the history of the island. The island was occupied by the Spanish in 1885. Then in 1899, the Spanish sold the island uh, to, the, to the Germans. The Germans were already sort of getting ready. The situation in, in Europe and around was quite tense. And soon we, we're going to see the First World War starting in uh, 1914. But we see that preparation that the Germans are in need of roads. They are organizing their infrastructure. They are on the island and they want to use their vehicles and move them across the island. So they need those roads. And they order the islanders to build these roads. However, the chief and the villagers refused to build these roads and there was not really much that the Germans could do. They tried to threaten them in, with many different things and they also tried to, uh, to make a, um, a pressure on the inhabitants when it comes to their economy. So they basically threatened to remove the stones or rye until the roads were built. So they threatened them with that, but nobody cared. And then there was somebody who was really smart and actually spent a little bit of time trying to understand the people on the island. And they had an idea that the, the stones actually function in a very different way. So they took some black paint and drew German crosses on all of the stones and then declared the ownership of the stones now that the stones actually belonged to the Germans. Uh, people of Yap panicked. Uh, they were in their eyes, they were really poor. There was absolute chaos and panic on the island and they built the roads. When they were finished, the Germans then washed off the crosses um, uh, with the, the black paint, they washed it off. And, uh, and as we have in the records, basically, the, the islanders were extremely happy and they, they saw it as their money was back. From that point on as well, the Germans banned any importation of the rye from uh, any neighboring islands. Later on in 1915, the Germans gave the islands to Japan and uh, the Japanese also wanted to build more roads and crushed the stones to, fit, to, to have this road fill. And you can see some of the surviving roads. Here's one in the photograph. We have a little bit of numbers about these stones. So in 1929, the island's wealth consisted of over 13,000 stones. We also know that the last stones were made in 1931. And presently there are 
about 6,600 of these stones remaining on the island. It was soon recognized that the, um, the, the, the stones were very valuable cultural property. And um, in 1965, the law prohibited the removal of the stone money from the island without official taxation and approval of the transaction by the Yapis government. And um, by that point, we do already have a lot of stones across the world in different museums. And, and there are still stones coming out. If you follow any of the auctions, for example, of ethnographic material, there's still some stones that appear at the auctions, but they're really rare and they go for a lot of money. So let's talk about that connection between the Yap stone money and the Bitcoins. What, what is actually really happening here? When it comes to cryptocurrency and that digital blonde, uh, blockchain uh, technology, we tend to see, uh, seem to believe that this is very recent innovation. However, we have already seen a glimpse of it, that that is not true at all, that that technology, those ideas, the philosophy of it was rooted in the ancient past, past specifically with the, with the Yap and its stone money. And nowadays, it is widely believed that these uh, Yap stones influenced the invention of the Bitcoin itself in 2008. So we see that manufacturing and value of both Bitcoin and Rai were established on many uh, principles that are quite similar, and I will also share that with you. This, um, the, mo the most important one is that shared ledger that we see, and the that oral ledger and the blockchain that were used to track the ownership for centuries on the island before the computers were invented. And basically when the Bitcoin was introduced, it was exactly the same philosophy, exactly the same system. It was just more advanced to the point that now it became more like um, we have a wider geographic reach and wider uh, global community instead of just one island. So the Bitcoin allows that same uh, philosophy to actually be used uh, around the world. The blockchain. So what is really that blockchain? So um, I've already mentioned that there's this very strong comparison between the Rai and that newly established cryptocurrencies that use that blockchain technology. So the blockchain digital ledgers that track financial transactions in real time across the computer network to ensure that they are seamless and incorruptible. Again, the concepts, concepts are quite complicated, but I'm trying to, to simplify them as much as possible. And hopefully through understanding how the YAP money worked, you can actually understand how the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies work. So you can actually understand it much better through that example. The both um, rely on blockchain. So both the Yapstone money and the cryptocurrencies rely on that blockchain, which demands a unified and continuous chain of information to ensure that the value is known and ownership is undisputable. So we have uh, two theories as well, or two uh, ideas that come out of, of this research that suggest that stone money is an exemplary ancient analog to blown chain that used that oral ledgers or the oral history that we talked about to create accurate and unbroken lines of communication, just like what we talked about the stones and that memory, collective memory. So communication so that economic relationships involving Rai could be established, maintained, and so on. And also could be uh, the uh, uh, progenitor or originator that inspired the development of Bitcoin. The, and again, I'm just, I, I'm not, I don't want to go in circles, but I'm really trying to explain this from different angles so that we can all understand this concept uh, much better and to just make it more clear. So blockchain, this digital record keeping system that is the ledger. So blockchain itself is that ledger where, um, which is maintained, established, maintained and secured using computer processing power. The blockchain itself and uh, cryptocurrency is 
decentralized, meaning there is not a single authority that is in charge of it, like one bank or so on. And the word that is often used to describe it is trustless. So trustless cryptocurrency, trustless ledger, or that list of transactions uh, on which only additions can be made. The reason why we often say trustless is because you do not need to trust it because all the information is there all the information is available to everybody and, and it's not corruptible. So the ledger history cannot be changed and all computers on the blockchain have that same ledger, have exactly the same information. So the advantages of this technology or this philosophy is that transactions maintain consistency completeness within each block of the chain, allowing participants to trust. Even if they do not trust other participants, they trust the system and they trust the transactions. The transactions are not uh, corruptible. It's not possible to corrupt the trans transactions. Blockchain removes third-party interference, centralization, and backup issues. Just for example, in that example, uh, uh, that instance with the banks. A blockchain can potentially be done for a nominal fee compared to other financial transactions, as we always famously knew how much the bank fees actually cost. So the way when we look at that same philosophy, that same theory through the YAP oral ledger, we see that same thing. So all tribes people or all villagers know and keep track of every transaction within their village. They all know who owns what and how much. Anytime a transaction is made, all the people in the tribe are gathered and are told about that particular transaction. And they all update essentially that mental database in their head of who owns what. And here I just wanna end with other similarities because the blockchain is the one that is always most emphasized that that ledger this is where everybody talks about but there's much more than that so we have that scarcity of both uh, bitcoin and cryptocurrency when we talk about the bitcoin there's currently 70 million bitcoins out there and the limit uh, was set by satoshi in 2008 to 21 million, which is going to happen in 2140. We also see generation of new units. So how the new units are generally generated solely to uh, what we call the contribution of work. So when we talk about the Bitcoins, the Bitcoins are mined and we've seen with the stones, they're mined or carved from caves and uh, shelters. So the mining itself, when it comes to Bitcoins, this is the, um, I have right here the little definition. So mining is a process in which units of the digital currency are created as a reward for assembling a valid block of transactions that is accepted by the network and posted to the shared ledger. So once the new block is created, the successful miner can then claim unit of quick cryptocurrency. Another way how this um, mining is, um, is explained or compared is like a puzzle. So the blockchain is a giant puzzle and each puzzle has, um, has to be fitted into the right place. And there's trillions of um, questions and, uh, and, and, um, problems that need to be solved in order to fit that piece of puzzle into the larger piece. So whoever actually ends up finishing that puzzle is then that successful miner. However, many other miners contribute to that process. I mean, multiple trillion um, uh, actions are done by multiple people, multiple miners, but again, only the one who really finished it is the most successful. However, that's not really a problem because that miner that won this particular one also contributed to mining of many other um, units or blocks that then other miners win. As 
Next one, uh, sorry, the numbers uh, readjusted. Uh, so resource in um, intensity. So both require immense power to operate. So YAP, we have lots of planning and labor, and we talked all about that. And the blockchain is, uh, we see that tremendous computing power and expertise is needed. Um, there been a lot of talk as well, especially during the early days, how much power was used during mining and how harmful this was and, and so on. Method of value transfers is transfer via public announcements to a network of participants, both for um, YAP with the villagers and through the blockchain in cryptocurrency. We also have this di distributed ledger, so transparent ledger of ownership. We talked about that already, so that's the biggest similarity. So YAP is oral ledger and blockchain ledger, so the transparency is the key. Also, physical possession is not required for the ownership, either of YAP stone, as we also have seen, uh, nor the Bitcoins, because Bitcoins are not material, They're, they do not exist in the physical world, they only exist in the world of ideas. And the last one is the scaling challenges, so basically the limitations. So uh, size limit is a challenge as well for each Bitcoin or cryptocurrency block, because we already talked about the limit is 21 million. And for YAP, the population growth, because the more people, the more uh, stone, it's harder to keep in memory, it's harder to keep track. So there is definitely the finite number of how many can be remembered. The Bank of Canada has the largest known ride uh, outside of YAP. And here you can see it on display in the, in, in, in the gallery. And here, when they were building a new, a new gallery, they had to remove the stone and place it back inside. So you can see this tremendous effort that went into moving the stone. Again, same as before. And um, proudly, I can say that uh, University of Calgary has a stone as well. You can see it here in the photo. It was generously donated by uh, George Mance from Regina in 2019. Uh, it is housed in Nico Galleries in the, in the library, in the main library building. And uh, even though it's smaller, is actually one of the more valuable stones because we can tell uh, through analysis of the stone that is one of the older stones. Um, we can see that the Bank of Canada one uh, looks like a later stone because it looks like the, the machine drilling uh, created this hole here. So this is uh, where I am with, uh, with my talk. So thank you all so very much. And um, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. And the recording will stop now. I know Maya will turn it off. And uh, Maya, <laughs> we here? I can...